Okay, let's answer some questions from Sunday's Market Outlook. A request from one of several CFA plus clinical pharmacists watching regularly. I know you take no active waiting in healthcare, but I was hoping you'd be able or willing to have a specialist create a biotech pharma video in the spirit of your Akamai video in your applied market series. Watching the pro way the pros do it will go a long way in our equity research development. Yeah, so it would be a matter of finding someone um, that I know is qualified. Uh, you know, not somebody who says, oh, I can do it, but isn't qualified, but somebody that I know is qualified. And that's a very specific area. Uh, so um, I have used the XLV. And I'll write that on the screen. XLV is the um, ETF that tracks the healthcare sector of the S&P 500. Uh, but I haven't really gone into any particular stocks. Actually, that's not true. Back in, I think, 2012, I owned Pfizer for a while when it was in the 20s. Uh, I did okay on it, but I like everything you know that goes up that you think, okay, well, that's pretty good. You sell it too soon just to watch it go higher and higher. Uh, but I normally don't um, invest in things I don't understand. Biotech is something I do just don't understand. Uh, I think you really have to be uh, um, either a doctor uh, or a pharmacist uh, in, in the particular field or the drug that's being tested and understand, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and what it all means. Uh, I don't understand it, so I just avoid it. Um, in the sector studies, uh, in order to outperform the broad market, you propose swinging your portfolio weighting between cyclicals and defensive, depending on the stage of the economic cycle. <clears throat> yeah, in an expansion, XLY will outperform SPY. My question, is there any benefit to add more factors into this balancing mix such as growth? Yeah, NASDAQ will outperform. Uh, you'll find that what is in the uh, triple Qs or the Qs uh, has a big overlap with XLY. Um, diversifying the, <clears throat> the allocation during the boom cycle between XLY and Q and between XLP and VTV during the bus cycle. Any benefit? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Here's a short question. <laughs> Do you think TLT uh, price movement is largely influenced by forward rate hikes cuts expectations? No, it's uh, influenced by the price of the bonds that it holds. Uh, it'll have a net asset value, and its net asset value is based on the value of what it is holding. And the bonds will be uh, uh, influenced by changes uh, in spot rates, which is a function of the changes in the par curve. And now you point out that you see 10 and 20 uh, treasury yields decreasing uh, by a certain number of basis points. Uh, that is, if you have to look at the whole curve and how the whole curve is changing uh, because uh, the par curve from that you derive individual spot rates and you discount each specific cash flow by that particular spot rate so it's you know it's not just you know if I'm holding a 20-year bond it's not just the 20-year uh, par rate changing that will affect the price it's all the other uh, rates at the same time uh, again, on TLT, after the failure of FRC, which had been bought by J.P. Morgan, I expected a flight to quality towards Treasuries and USD. Instead, TLT decreased by approximately 3%. So, you know, we're in that period of the market now where you can make sense of every move, depending if you want to uh, say... The economy is strong, there's no need for the Fed to cut rates, therefore yields are going up. Uh, or um, the, uh, uh, the economy underlying is weak and the Fed is going to uh, break the uh, economy by raising rates so long rates go down. So no matter which way the market goes right now, there is a valid argument both ways. So it's hard to uh, attribute cause and effect uh, to these things. It's, it's, you know, after the fact... There's a rational explanation, but before the fact, it's almost unpredictable when you have a market that seems to be oscillating between, um, you know, 
no landing, Fed's going to pivot, everything's going to be fine, inflation is fading away to two days later, Fed's not cutting rates anytime soon, we're going to be higher for longer and the discount rate is too high, money is fleeing banks, and inflation is resurging again to maybe 17 minutes later, there's going to be no landing, the Fed's going to pivot, everything's going to be fine, inflation's... Like, the way the market oscillates during the course of the day and the way the narrative just shifts, it's hard to keep track of. So um, I'm hesitant to say, oh, it was because of this or because of that. It was one of the interpretations winning out that day, and that was it. That's about the best I can say. Uh, will you ever post a video about thorough analysis of company earnings? Um, yeah, I've. Uh, if you look at the bottom up, I have done agency. Uh, uh, we did look at agencies, and we go right through agencies uh, uh, 10 uh, or their uh, filing, uh, and I break down how they make their money and, and uh, the explanation of all the different terms on, on the income statement balance sheet that we may not understand. Uh, so I, I, uh, I have done that. There will be more. I tried to analyze earnings of Citibank. A bank is challenging, especially a big bank, especially a bank that, that does a whole bunch of things. A bank is very challenging. It's easier to start with a regional bank that has a banking book, uh, but no trading book, or a very minimal trading book, but really is, is a banking book. Um, but once you start getting into uh, uh, capital markets, um, m a wealth management uh, and all the different divisions it can get very complicated very quickly and there's probably a lot of definitions you might not not be aware of so it's always easier to start with a simple bank and i will do one i'm just in cfa mode right now because i still do that so you know four or five months out of the year uh, i contribute to the cfa side of things and then uh, the rest of the time i contribute to the applied series so i will be back uh, contributing to the applied series probably mid mid June end of June so we're almost there another five six seven weeks uh, what else have we got here with short-term interest rates so high why do you think banks is still unwilling to raise their interest on deposits when we say banks are unwilling uh, to raise their interest rates we have to uh, define uh, what bank uh, what type of banks are unwilling to raise the rates. Uh, larger banks have no reason to raise the rates. In fact, they probably don't want to raise their rates. I would expect at least the same interest which I can get from money market. <clears throat> uh, I don't know a bank why a bank would ever do that. <clears throat> why would I ever want to deposit and leave my money in a bank if I can invest uh, less than one year horizon uh, with 5% uh, interest? Well, most banks have their own uh, money market funds. Right, so Bank A uh, has a deposit uh, of which uh, all it can do is pay you interest on, right? But it also has a money market fund, so it'll tell you, uh, you know, why don't you put your money in the money market fund? Well, there are fees, assets under management. And these money market funds buy assets. And these assets have a yield which then it gives to you. So it doesn't cost the bank anything for you to put your money in a money market mutual fund because the assets pay your yield and it gets asset under management fees. There's no money for it here and why should it pay you money? That you're not getting any money is great because it'll send you to its own family of mutual funds. It wants you in its own family of mutual funds because assets under management, it has fees now. Um, smaller banks that don't have their own family of uh, money market funds uh, sometimes uh, get um, some percentage of the asset management fee uh, if they uh, direct deposits to a particular money market fund. Uh, but let's not forget that there's still a lot of money from, from investment fees and management fees out of these funds that you can't really get out of, uh, out of a bank account, right? Okay. Uh, have you considered to include in your membership area a risk parity portfolio module covering long only uh, buy and hold multi asset class portfolios that get quarterly rebalanced? Uh, selling options, targeting a fixed allocation percent. Okay, I, I, I see where you're getting. Just have different model portfolios. Um, rather than do that, because I risk 
uh, people copying me if I do that and I can't have that rather than do that what's what I'm going to be doing this August is the portfolio construction and management module uh, where we basically start from scratch and we build uh, we build a portfolio but in building the portfolio I'm not trying to beat anything I'm not trying to outperform anything we're going to um, try a whole bunch of different types of trades so that you then know how to do something but the choice of what assets you use I got to leave that to you I can't be seen as giving you uh, advice buy this sell that do this do that now in my mar market outlooks I tell you what I'm doing ahead of time I tell you what I'm doing so that I stand to be proven right or I stand to be proven wrong I think it is unsatisfying when somebody tells you uh, after the market closed what they did that day you know you want to impress me tell me what you're going to do before the market opens let's see if you're right or wrong so I do put it out there but I am not giving investment advice I'm just sort of showing you the process I go through in arriving at the positions I want I have to be very careful I cannot put a model portfolio up and rebalance it and have people copy me I can't do that but I can show you how you would uh, uh, build one of these portfolios the rules you would follow the rebalancing rules that you would follow how you can identify value how you can identify growth uh, certain ETFs that you would use how you can identify individual uh, stocks within the ETFs that you want to overweight or underweight and then the cho what you pick is purely up to you so I will give you process I will give you how the what I have to really leave up to you uh, let's see I'm surprised to see that despite the record low volatility you're still looking to gain exposure by owning the underlying uh, selling puts well be careful here I'm selling puts because I'm short uh, I'm selling puts because I've also sold calls I'm not so you know when you when you see that uh, somebody's doing this you have to understand that they may have other things in their portfolio which makes sense for them to do that as opposed to it being an independent trade on its own uh, it's highly correlated with a bunch of other positions I have so for me to sell these puts is almost like locking in a certain profit uh, at worst case scenario I lock in a guaranteed profit by selling puts best case scenario I protect myself if the market rallies and I make some money on the puts and then I then use that that money that I made to sell some calls to the upside with the house's money so uh, you can't look at what I'm doing each position in isolation it is it is a um, a portfolio level trade uh, as opposed to buying leap calls on the cheap which should appreciate when volatility comes back online well uh, volatility and the market are inversely related right so here's volatility volatility spikes market goes down if I bought calls the Delta uh, 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 of the market dropping would drop my calls even if implied volatility is increasing it would increase on the puts but it would not increase on the calls um, unless you mean uh, uh, buying uh, puts uh, uh, well then sure I mean I can buy puts I just um, it wouldn't it wouldn't fit with what I'm doing I guess is, is uh, uh, I guess the conclusion there uh, in a previous video you talked about what uh, I should explain why it doesn't fit uh, with what I'm doing let's say that I buy puts I'm already short the market so let's say that I, 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 I buy puts and the market goes up uh, now I lose on my short beta position and I lose on my put long put position but if I sell puts uh, and the market goes down well these puts are offsetting some of this short beta and because of the overlap I'm locking in a guaranteed profit but if the market goes up my short beta position will hurt me but my short put position will help me so if it if the market drops I lock in a guaranteed gain if the market goes up I reduce my loss so that's why the the put helps me out a lot better um, you talked about watching volatility no I talked about watching volume not volatility on zero day to expiration options 
I watch the volume where the volume is showing up and you just have to have the options chain open with volume and you'll see all the strike prices and you'll see where the volume is and the numbers are dynamic which means the volume is live so you're seeing where the volume is changing you're just looking at the screen you're eyeballing it and you're saying there's a lot of volume change over here and less volume change here so I know the dealer has to be on the other side of that so I know exactly what the dealer has to do and since there's zero data expiration options the dealer can't wait till the end of the day to hedge out they pretty much have to do so uh, dynamically like you know usually every every five or ten minutes they're gonna have to uh, do something with the undermine if not faster uh, let's see do you have any videos on how to use logistical market operations to your advantage not really no no because I I don't you know there's um, structural issues with the market their behavioral issues this is uh, I don't know that I would call this a, a structural issue as much as behavioral uh, it's in vogue now zero data expiration options are in vogue everything has its time uh, I don't know that this will hang around long enough for it to become for it to be a structural thing that you can take advantage of and behavioral inefficiencies tend to disappear very quickly um, add that to the fact that most of these players lose money every day most of them lose money every day they'll come a point where everybody eventually blows up and they go away uh, so this is not something that has legs this is not a structural uh, thing to the market that's going to last any period of time at some point this will be over uh, and and we will enter into some new bull market at some point and when we're there most of these zero data expiration options most of the volume uh, I think will die down and it won't be as exciting uh, let's see on the news from Monday 1st of May about Treasury defaulting on its debt or well uh, potentially defaulting if they don't reach an agreement and the Congress having to take the decision of raising the debt ceiling what is your view of the situation in regards to the effect that it could have to the inflation in US economy I'm unsure as to whether this article should be treated as relevant um, well you know there's lies on both sides right uh, the Democrats are lying just as much as the Republicans the Democrats are saying Republicans don't want to pay their bills we're a country that pays our bills no Republicans want to pay the bill they just want the spending to stop you can't just keep throwing another trillion dollars on the fire and then another trillion dollars on the fire then another trillion dollars. that has to stop you know debt to GDP even removing the central bank debt uh, uh, for the Treasury um, is still over a hundred percent of GDP that's starting to get into alarm bell territory you know at some point that's not going to work out well at some point there's going to be a reckoning so it's not as if the Republicans are saying we don't want to pay our bills the Republicans are saying we'll gladly pay the bills but in exchange you gotta slow down with the credit card you know like just maybe take a breather on the credit card why don't we just lower the balance on the credit card and we'll pay the debt yeah I don't know if you've ever uh, as a you know young person gotten into trouble with your credit card and your parents say fine we'll help you out but we're tearing up the credit card yeah they're not saying we're not gonna pay your credit card they're just saying we gotta do something about your spending we'll bail you out here and this is what the Republicans are saying is like, well, we're not saying let's default but what we are saying is you know we will threaten it if you just if, if you if you think that you're gonna keep on spending and spending so there are lies going on on both sides um, but uh, it's politics I don't think I said anything odd there when I said lies going on on both sides and hypocrisy on both sides well that's the definition of politics so politics is going on people um, you know what most most other times I would say I, I don't think I would worry about it but I don't know anymore uh, you know politics has just gotten to be such a clown show I really just don't know anymore so this one here why there isn't 
a higher level of concern about this than every other time, I don't know why. I mean, it's curious why there isn't just a higher level of concern about it than other times. But it's the same concern, you know, as other times. Oh, they'll get it done. They're grandstanding and they'll go down to the wire, down to the last minute, and then they'll pass something. They'll kick the can down the road till February, and then we'll do it all again in February, and the market will forget all about it three days later because some, you know... So I don't. I, I think the market is is like, yeah. You know, we've seen this clown show before. It is a clown show. We know it's a clown show. And what are you gonna do? But I don't know that anybody's really, really worried. Mm, past two years, OPEC introduced two major production cuts. Given these cuts in current prices, do you think the demand has weakened a lot and could be a sign of a recession? Usually when there's concern about global growth, uh, global growth is energy intensive. GDP is energy intensive. Some countries' GDP is more energy intensive than other countries, but there's a certain amount of energy for every dollar of GDP. So if GDP is, is, is going to be dropping, then yes, there is going to be some drop in demand for energy, and oil being the most proximate one uh, tends to take uh, the biggest hit. Um, but you can always deal with that with production cuts. I think this time, though, it is Iranian oil. From what I heard today, the level of production out of Iran is higher than pre-COVID or higher than some critical level, uh, which is more, even though OPEC cut, Iran is, is, is boosting its, its output and putting oil on the market uh, so that there's plenty of oil uh, to go around. But um, oil dropping is usually a sign that growth uh, is slowing and oil prices are highly correlated with GDP growth. Uh, about your pure recession play, does it make sense to have uh, some exposure to gold or gold miners in case of a recession ahead? Um, since gold performance is usually good in recessions historically, well, then you're making your own case. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to do the research for you. You're telling me gold performance is usually good in a recession, uh, and if there is a recession, should you be there? You're, you're sort of giving me the conclusion you want me to reach. So at that point, I would say if you've reached that conclusion, if your historical analysis shows that that is uh, the case, um, then sure. About Air A B and B, I think you mean Airbnb or A A A B N B, A B and B. What do you think of their business model? Is it a ticker A B N B or is that Airbnb? I don't know. Hang on a second. I got somebody beside me. I'm going to ask. Can you uh, do A B N B and tell me if that's something? Is it Airbnb? Okay, it's a ticker for Airbnb. Look at that, eh? Uh, what do you think of the business model? Uh, I think nothing, I don't know. I think it's a business model. I know it's a broad question, but it'd be useful to hear your analysis. Uh, uh, I've never used it, I guess. Uh, I have considered it. I have considered using it, that if I wanted to go somewhere for a month or something, I would consider Airbnb. Uh, but they do have competition. Um, I think... Quite a few of the places on Airbnb, you actually are staying with other people or with the owner of the house, but a Verbo, VRBO, I think it is, uh, you get the whole house to yourself. So there, there is competition. I imagine it's a business model, otherwise it wouldn't exist. I guess that's about the most I could say about it. I've never really spent any time with it. Uh, do you know of a similar ladder ETF strategy based in the U.S.? Uh, no, I do not. I think you're talking about uh, preferreds. No, I do not. Uh, so, um, would PFF be one? I'm not familiar with PFF. Uh, if we already paper trade through IBKR, uh, will we be able to reset our accounts? Yes, you can. You can reset. Curious to know how many shares of agency you picked up with a dropping below its uh, tangible book value per share today. Uh, 3,500. I try. I did it on. Um, um, because they're in my taxable accounts, my tax, my tax free, not my tax free, my uh, RSP accounts are loaded up. Uh, there's not too much I can do uh, in there. Uh, so in my taxable accounts, I use uh, synthetics. Uh, so I used a $10, uh, I think it was uh, June 
24 uh, uh, synthetic where you uh, sell the put and you buy the call and I think the in price was negative 168 uh, because you're front end loading all the dividends in this right uh, so uh, yeah negative 168 and then you just uh, you just wait I put an order out for quite a bit of them and I think I got 35 35 synthetics filled right and each uh, each synthetics for a hundred a hundred shares uh, so 3500 uh, in a taxable account you don't want to buy them right because you're going to have currency exposure uh, number one number two you're gonna have a tax withholding from the US and because these aren't qualified dividends the tax withholding is 30 percent so you're gonna have a 30 percent tax withholding so your dividend drops to 70 percent of what it should be uh, but on a continuously compounded basis they are within the options if you're doing a synthetic you have it within the options uh, at least you have it loaded up in the puts. The reason it's only negative 168 is because, of course, I'm buying the calls, right? I didn't have to buy the calls, and I'd, I'd have them all loaded in the puts, which means I could have gone to a $12 put or a $14 put and just sold a whole bunch of puts. Uh, but I created a synthetic. Um, I'll pick up more. I'm more than happy to pick up more. Are you able to show how you get the options IV panel? Yeah, uh, so um, uh, open up a chart. And you have a menu system across the top. The very first one, click the menu, and you will see um, what is the first menu? Uh, chart parameters. If you click on chart parameters, you'll get a whole thing up, and then you'll get a panel down here with a whole bunch of little boxes. A whole bunch of little boxes, right? Where you can click on volume, you can click on uh, show dividends. Uh, there's one way over here implied volatility. So open up the first uh, menu system, it'll drop down. The last one I, I think is clear all annotations. Click on the first one, chart parameters. You'll get this box up. Look for the panel here that has, has all these little check boxes. And look for the one that says option implied volatility. Uh, would love to get your thoughts on CRE investing. Hmm. Challenging. Yeah, so I don't know if you want my thoughts. You should get your bank's thoughts on CRE investing because uh, you're asking, you know, what if you buy a small little strip mall? Well, Unless you're paying cash, you need a bank to be on board with you, and most banks' books are closed when it comes to commercial real estate. Uh, it doesn't matter how good of a credit risk you are. Some banks are just saying, that's it, we're full. We want no more exposure to this sector. And that's the end of it. Uh, they won't even entertain a loan. 50% loan to value? Nope. What about 40? Nope. What about 30? Nope. Um, when I went to buy a house in uh, 2008, uh, it was a two thousand. It was a fall of two thousand nine. This is when the market was, no, fall of two thousand eight. I think, yeah. Uh, market was falling apart because of uh, the mortgage crisis, or was it two thousand nine? Anyways, it was in that period. Okay, get off my back. It was in that period, and uh, the I was pre-approved. I went back. I said, okay, here's the house I want. Nope. I said, well, what if I put fifty percent down and you just finance fifty? Nope. I went all the way to 90. I said, I'll put 90% down. What about 10%? Nope, nothing, nothing. They weren't touching mortgages at all. I couldn't get any kind of mortgage. I had to pay cash. Now, they knew I had the money to pay cash, and they still wouldn't give me any part of a mortgage. So, um, CRE, yeah. If, you know, my opinion of it doesn't matter if you need financing. You got to get a bank on board. And even if you do get a bank on board, what's your interest rate going to be, right? You got to finance this asset. Uh, that will tell you everything you need to know. Looking at a strip mall in a decent sized U.S. city that has about three to seven shops for rent. It has three to seven for rent or three to seven that are rented. There's a difference for, about, you know, buying an empty strip mall or buying a strip mall with three or seven units empty that you need to rent hard to get people in if they are rented uh you know retail is flighty restaurants and pizzas are always great like pizza place sub places they're really good dentist's office doctor's offices they're really good liquor places they're really good uh but things like uh, gift shops or, or retail in strip malls are not good at all those and same with like 
those uh i don't know if they still have them around but you ever see those tanning tanning places where you go to get a tan those things are you know they come and go they come and go so it's a matter of well what kind of tenant base do you have and do you need it financed and if you need it financed it doesn't matter what anybody's opinion is it matters what the bank's opinion is because you got to show up there and get financing uh what's the rationale for selling spy 4170 puts um because we have markets that have lots of volatility you know we go down for two days then we go right back up for a day or two days maybe three then we go down for a couple of days maybe we go down for half an hour we go up for 18 minutes we go down for 43 minutes we go up for 32 minutes you're up and down and up and down you got to be really tactical uh, uh with these things so i've been day trading the 4170s for quite some time uh, I was I had sold the 4170 calls. If you look at the volume on the 41 on the June 4170s today, I was 100% of the volume at that strike price on both the calls and the puts today. So you can see what kind of volume I did. I was 100% of the volume. Well, I shouldn't say I was 100% of the volume. I was 50% of the volume because somebody had to be on the other side of the trade. So somewhere in the world, somebody else is claiming to be 100% of the volume as well. So. I was involved in 100% of the contracts. That's a better way to, to say it. And now I have 4170 puts. Uh, I started at, I think I got some at 82, 92, 102, and 108. I sold at 108. And if you look at the closing price for the 4170 puts today, the high price, 108. Proud of that one. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to the market. If the market goes up, I make money on my puts. If the market goes down, well, I sold. Uh, I'm short the market anyways, and I sold 4150 calls. So the difference between the 4150 calls, 4170 puts, locks in a guaranteed profit. Worst case scenario, I lock in a guaranteed profit. Uh, so that's not bad. Uh, let's see. Uh, another part of the premise is the spread between earnings yield and 10-year treasury rate is simply not high enough to justify taking on the additional equity risk to make them sufficiently attractive relative to the risk-free rate. Yardini posts an interesting chart. Only in the last two decades was it normal to have a large spread of earnings yield over a risk-free rate. That's because the risk-free rate was so bloody low to begin with. And before 2003, we had another two decades where the risk-free rate ran above the earnings yield. That's because yields on 10-year treasuries um heck were what eight percent nine percent in the 80s 10 percent 11 12 sometimes i think throughout the uh even throughout the 90s the yield on the 10-year was what seven seven and a half eight percent you know here we are thinking when we pushed up to four and a half percent well four and a half percent on a 10-year you know the 90s called and said <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'd never touch it for four and a half percent. You got to give me at least seven. Uh, so the yields were so much higher on uh, on treasuries then. Uh, let's see. And if we are having a sea change, as Howard Marks uh, uh, of a change of market conditions from the past two decades of low yields, should we then be looking at this differently by putting less weight on the earnings yield as a major factor? Um. Yeah, I, I I can see that 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 uh, it would not you know if if that is the case, but then again you know you have to think about um, well what do you mean by uh, or what when he when he suggests we're not going to have these low yields again, um, that could be, but that does not necessarily mean we're going to have the high yields of the twenty years before. We may not have the low yields of the last twenty years. But it doesn't mean we revert back to what we had 20 years prior to that. Um, all you can do, I think, is use the data you have in the day that you are. You know, 20 years ago, would we have looked at certain at, at other things? Probably. In uh, two, three years or four years, would we be looking at other things? Probably. Um, but given given where you are at any point in time, all you can do is use uh, is use what you have available. Uh, so what it's going to be in the future, I really don't know. <clears throat> there is, a, you know, you can use that argument that we're not going back to the zero line. Or you can say, well, hang on a second. I can make a demographic argument 
uh, that the U.S. will be Japan. That uh, 2021 uh, uh, was uh, uh, the U.S.'s 1990 Japan moment. And uh, from 1990 uh, onwards, uh, demographics in Japan have been um, deflationary. And for the longest time, Japan wanted inflation. Printing, 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 got, you know, bringing interest rates down to zero. <clears throat> Yield curve control, got to get inflation, got to get inflation. Uh, you know, been trying for 30 years. It's finally just showing up. <clears throat> Um, 2021 just might have been, you know, with the acceleration of the retirement, might have been uh, the U.S.'s uh, 1990s Japan moment, where for the next 30 years, uh, the U.S. may be fighting undesirable demographics uh, and have to push interest rates down to zero because Japan was, I don't want to say they're xenophobic, but <clears throat> they were uh, not a friend to immigration. Uh, they... Uh, um, and this goes back historically hundreds of years in Japan. And Japan is for the Japanese, uh, period. I mean, in, in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, if you uh, uh, were in that part of the world on a ship, you did not approach the island of Japan. You just did not approach it, uh, period. Everyone knew that. Uh, that sort of culture has stayed. Will the U.S. embrace immigration more and avoid that 30-year deflationary demographic uh, trend? That's my answer. Big question mark. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> One thing to note on credit spreads is that industrials are tighter than index-level data would suggest. Uh, the U.S. Ag Corp Index uh, consists 23% of banks. Oh, bank credit uh, still trades wide. Uh, and some credits have flatter inverted spread curves. Okay, well then that's even that's even uh, less fear than what the index. The index is sort of suggesting there's no fear, but you you have a point there. If you control for uh, where there is fear, then that means the rest of the index is even less fearful. So even though the index looks somewhat wider. In the beginning of the year, much of it comes from banks, but industrials trade five basis points off the tights, which seem to me fairly optimistic, given the fact that lending standards should uh, or have tightened. Also, inverted spread curves and outright spread levels also show stress in financials. Yeah, uh, that is a good point. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, other than making the point, there's no question in there, but uh, you bring up a good point. <clears throat> Uh, it's trying to recover some of the annualized DC, ECI numbers, and I'm not sure how they got them. Total, uh, 1.2. We get approximately 4.8. I get it. How did they analyze wages and salaries from 1.2 to 5? Um, well, it's it's the weighting of the overall compensation. How much do wages make up of the compensation? How much do benefits make up of the compensation? And even though the combined amount was 1.2% quarter over quarter, the wages index and the benefits index might not have been the same 1.2% quarter over quarter. I think the benefits uh, was closer to, I think one of them was 1.5 or closer to 1.5. One was closer to 1, I don't know. Uh, you'd have to look into it, but each uh, the 1.2 was for the combined cost index. And then you have the wages, in, wages uh, index and then you have a benefits index. May I ask for your take on this week's movement in MREITs? Um, well, it's uh, uh, spreads. The uh, spread between the mortgage-backed security uh, and the 10-year uh, are widening. And mortgage REITs have exposure to that spread. So when that spread widens, um, they their asset value drops because they don't hedge out the spread. They try to hedge out the interest rate risk as best as possible. Then they lever up the spread. And I think uh, agency is at like 7.7 .7 times the spread. Annalise at a little under 7 times the spread. So, you know, you have to think about the effect of one basis point of spread widening is like 7.7 .7 basis points of spread widening. Uh, and spreads are, are widening. Well, that's great because they are not going to stay that wide. These, these basically have an implied government guarantee. But what happens when interest rates go up? 
is uh, prepayments go down. And when prepayments go down, the duration of these bonds increase significantly, which means their sensitivity, the percentage change in the uh, value of the MBS uh, increases as interest rates go up because prepayments come down, duration goes up, they become more sensitive to changes in interest rates. Well, when you have uh, duration increasing on these, and that would mean that spread duration is increasing on these as well. When you lever up the spread 7.7 .7 times and you have a higher spread duration and for every one basis point, you're actually getting a change uh, in the uh, a delta S of 7.7 .7 for every one along with the, so, you know, the two things you're multiplying together are both increasing at the same time. That is a decrease in fair value on, uh, on your uh, balance sheet. So uh, they get hit uh, when those spreads widen, uh, which if you know what's going on and you have the stomach for it is a beautiful buying opportunity because spreads will always come back to where they were when the issue is resolved. Um, the average credit score uh, of uh, mortgage holders is nowhere near what it was in 2008. It's all high quality and these are all agency MBS. Uh, so there, there should be no fear or reaction uh, as it is. Part of, the, um, part of the problem, and I think it's overblown, is the uh, planned sale of SVB's assets. Much of it being, or a lot of it being mortgage-backed securities. So there's some thinking that, well, if all these, all, if all these securities are going to hit the market in a forced sale... Uh, it's going to depress prices, which will, uh, and since the treasury prices are going to stay the same, it's just going to keep blowing out the, the, the spreads. Uh, so I see this as a buying opportunity. Mm, VIX issue in calculating volatility. I saw Bloomberg News earlier last week that there's new one-day VIX index. Uh, do you think that's a better measure of the current market risk? I don't know. I uh, put it on my uh, on my watch screen. It requires a. Uh, it's an index. Um, I I don't know. I haven't I haven't really seen much use in it yet. Um, so I you know I'll I'll let you know. I mean it's only been since Monday and today's the end of Tuesday. It's only been two days and you know I haven't really seen much going on in it because, you know, yesterday was a stupid day. Today was a beautiful day which tomorrow going to be a stupid day, and then a beautiful day, then a stupid day, then a beautiful day. <laughs> 2.30, it's going to get beautiful, then stupid, then beautiful, then stupid, three, four times probably. Regarding your allocation factory on SPY, <clears throat> I was struggling to find SPY options that have 30-day expirations for the next 30 days. I already answered this one. Um, SPY has daily expiration. Um, it has zero day, one day, two days, three days, and then, of course, if three is Friday, four or five, it'll have six days, seven days, eight days, nine days, 10, 12, and like, you know, because it's not open on the weekends. Um, but if 30 days ends up being a Saturday or Sunday, then you use a 29 day or a 31 day. But you should be able to find 30, 30 day options rather easily on SPY. Last Q&A, you said in minute 104 that it would be reasonable to target an income of capital of 0 0.004 per day. Yeah, okay. Uh, so 100,000 could generate 400 a day. Uh, that is not quite uh, what I'm saying. I didn't say to target. I, I said you want to target a theta value of 0 0.004. So your total theta is 0 0.004, which is $400 per day. But you typically take your profit at 50% and you're not going to be right on all of them. You're going to be right, uh, probably, if you do it well enough, you could be right on about 90% of them. You're going to be wrong on 10% where you take 100% of the profit. Uh, so you should end up somewhere between 35 and 45% uh, of it being correct. So at $400 a day at 252 uh, 252 days, that would be 100K, and you should be able to grab 35 to 45% of that, which is 35 to 45,000 uh, 35 to 45,000 on 100,000. So that's 35 to 45% if you target that level. Um, yeah, 
I don't see that as unreasonable. I really don't. Um, where I where where it is unreasonable is a market like this where volatility on S and P decides to go down to thirteen and a half percent. Yeah, then then that becomes bloody hard to do. You've got to find some underlines that have volatilities in the probably thirty. 35 to 45 percent range i think that's a nice place to target so i've said it before gm is a beautiful beautiful stock to do this on um what's another good stock alcoa is another one but it moves in a wider and a wider band occidental is just a beautiful one to do this on absolutely you got to find the right underlines and when you find the right underlines like oxy anywhere from 5750 up to 67.50 and it just does that and it's just a beautiful uh, a beautiful one to play uh, same with GM 32 to 42 now these are beautiful to play because if they get put to you at those at fi if oxy gets put to you at 57.50 or GM at 32 beautiful uh, uh, you know there's no downside to owning them at, at those levels because at those at those prices it makes sense to own them um, but you can't do this on every single underlying. You, you know, it does take a while to find the right underlines, and you probably need about 10 to 15 good underlines so that you don't have too much concentration in, you know, three or four names, and that your underlines are across a number of different, uh, different sectors, and hopefully uh, in, in um, I wouldn't say different, uh, um, you know, uh, different types of, of, of balance sheets. Some may be very asset heavy, some more asset light. Uh, so it, it, once you find the right underlines, yeah, this is not an unrealistic thing to target. It, I mean, I do it, uh, and it's not unrealistic. Uh, do you think uh, the chance of recession showing up later this year is increased due to the fact that next year is a U.S. election year? Timing seems to line up with 2007, 2008. Well, here's the thing. Um, every four years, it's an election year. Uh, so 25% uh, of the years are election years. So when, you look, <clears throat> when you're looking at that kind of overlap uh, with what has gone on in the past, you got a 25% chance of seeing something uh, um, you know, show up saying, well, I saw it last time. Yeah, but there was a 25% chance it would happen anyways, uh, which is you know, not an insignificant percentage. So I don't know that there's <clears throat> that there's an increased probability simply due to the fact that it's an election year next year. Um, <clears throat> I, I I don't know that 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 would be anything more than just randomness showing up, being that twenty five percent of the of of all twenty five percent since the founding of the U S has been election year. Twenty five percent of the years have been election years, right? <clears throat> Let's see, where do you get the earnings list? If you look in the description box for the um, spreadsheet, the link to the spreadsheet, I get it in there. You might explain the custody process. Uh, so the custody process is you have a custodian uh, that basically oversees your account. Uh, they basically are uh, you know, in possession or, or they hold everything that you have in their own name. Uh, your external managers can trade in your accounts, but they cannot withdraw money. Uh, they can't abscond with the money. And at any given time, if your external manager says you own a thousand shares of Apple, uh, your custodian can verify it in a heartbeat because you just look at your account. And, and uh, that is what you pay your custodian for is to uh, say, yeah, these shares actually do exist. They're not just made up on some, on some sheet of paper somewhere. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Regarding the money supply, I know that the increase in money supply decreases velocity because of the mathematical equation. But if you increase money supply, doesn't it mean that more people will spend? Well, um, I think you're getting confused between money supply and income. More people will spend if they if you give them more income. But increasing the money supply does not necessarily mean that incomes increase. So it does not necessarily mean uh, that velocity will increase. If you increase the money supply, 
without increasing credit or without increasing incomes, you have what's called a liquidity trap where that money is just stuck in the bank and it stays in the banking sector. Uh, and it doesn't find its way into the economy through either increased credit or increased income. So it is not true that increasing the money supply means people will spend more. It only it, increasing credit means that they will spend more. Increasing incomes mean that they will spend more. Question regarding pension funds. What is your opinion on pension funds investing in private equity? Yeah, no problem. Um, pension funds have a long-term investment horizon. And when they have a long-term investment horizon, they can invest in illiquid assets. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with uh, um, um, pension funds investing in private assets uh, at all. Uh, uh, would you encourage a non-finance person? How would you encourage a non-finance person on the benefits of pension fund investing in risky assets? Well, who says they're risky? Uh, right? Listen, GDP has this kind of volatility. Earnings has this kind of volatility. Well, that makes sense because these companies use leverage. Uh, but stock prices have this kind of volatility. How do you get that? How do you get there? Right? This is overstated. So, you know, we say private assets, because they value their assets over a period of time, have this smoothing. So we unsmooth the return series to approach something like this. And I say, well, you know, okay, I can get that maybe these are too smooth, but these are too volatile. These are way too volatile. There's no way that, that uh, company valuation should be this volatile. Uh, so, you know, when we say that they're risky assets, they're not risky assets, they're illiquid assets. Um, and if you have a long-term investment horizon where you don't need the money for 20 years, there's nothing wrong with owning an illiquid asset. I mean, we could say the same of almost everybody in Canada who owns a home. Why are you investing in a private asset? Real estate is, for most people, their biggest investment. It's a private asset. It's highly illiquid with huge transaction costs and huge carrying costs. But yet, there it is, right? So no, I don't, I don't see it as, as risky at all. My, well, I shouldn't say that I don't see it as risky at all. I don't see it. I, I don't know that I would put the title risky assets on there if, if you think that they, it's, it's logical for them to invest in equities, even growth equities. I don't think it's illogical for them to invest in private assets. Uh, what does uh, betting on three-year SOFR yield collapse mean? Uh, I don't know if I ever said anything, the yield collapse, but maybe you heard it somewhere else. So um, if you're looking at three months so far, uh, there's a forward curve, and the forward curve right now looks like this, right? Whereas this, this I believe, is, uh, you know, where we are now. Uh, I might even be exaggerating it, but, uh, you know, you've got December, and then December of the following year looks like that. So the uh, curve... Uh, you know, has this inversion. If we say that there's a collapse of it, we think that short rates are going to drop significantly and the curve is going to start looking like this. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that over time, that three-month curve is going to have to start doing this. It's going to have to start flattening out uh, this way here, higher for longer. Uh, unless something significant really, really breaks and Listen, I think the uh, outflow of deposits from banks has a real potential to do this because it's not slowing down. It seems, it seems to be gaining steam and every day more people hear about it. They hear about another bank failure. They start thinking about their bank uh, and, and what they can do with their money in their bank. And, well, I could be in these funds that earn this much. My bank's not paying me anything. The system can't handle that kind of wholesale uh, uh, departure of deposits. Now, the Fed has said, listen, we'll, we'll lend money uh, at uh, whatever the balance sheet asset is. But if deposits are leaving, I mean, you're borrowing that money at a rate higher than what those, those uh, securities are paying, uh, you're losing money. And, you know, you can't... You can't reason with somebody who's worried about their money in the bank. You can't say your money's going to be safe. Well, you know what? It'll be safer in my own pocket. Well, you can't. You know, my bank's not paying me anything. 
what's the downside? It's like, it's kind of hard to come up with a downside. What's the downside? Like, even with, with uh, my own bank, I have uh, commercial deposits with, with significant dollars in them. Uh, I move them to Interactive Brokers because Interactive Brokers pays me 4.33% uh, on my money. My bank gives me nothing. Nothing. And um, as a, I think uh, on May 1st, uh, the, Canadian, the six Canadian banks reported their outflows. TD, I think it was like 5% uh, deposit outflows in Canada. They don't pay anything. And if you have a brokerage account, your brokerage account is willing to pay you is willing to pay you money on cash balances because that's what they use to lend to other people. So I think that, I think people are underestimating um, the potential for that, to, for there to be, I shouldn't say no fear, but this general lack of concern, it seems, um, to me is very puzzling. Uh, so that, that could create, you know, if money is leaving the banking system, and it starts leaving en masse to the point where, okay, listen, we're going to have bank failure after bank failure. Well, here's an easy way to get rid of the problem. If we reduce rates all the way to zero, there is no, there is no yield in money market funds. Screw all of you. Now, you. now you just leave your money in the bank because there's no point in going anywhere else. But something really big would have to break first. It would have to break first. Let's see. I bought uh, at the money puts. With the same expiration date as the S and P, at forty fifty, forty one fifty, uh, uh, forty one forty one fifty. Plan to sell a few. Oh, I bought them, and I plan to sell a few when the market drops to forty one. Should I sell out of the money, out the money, or in the money puts first? No, ah, you know it. It really depends on what you're trying to get done. Um, are you? Are you? trying to get back to even are you trying to show a profit are you trying to lock in a certain gain i mean you bought puts so you so basically you're losing money on them especially the 40 50. If the market starts dropping um let's say you you start to break even on the 41s what would you do then um you know i don't know um uh without you being beside me telling me what it is you're trying to get done and seeing you know how many puts have you got what other positions do you have um uh, are these your only positions do you have do you have something else that 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 was going up while this while you were losing on the puts did you buy the puts such that you could stay long on all your other positions you know like there's so many questions i would have to ask first to figure out what you were doing and what you're trying to get done there is no one answer to a question like that so um it's more complex than just saying do this or do that uh look this might be a stupid question apologies uh, if so but in an economy where gdp is starting to fall or slow and the level of sovereign debt to gdp is over 100 percent does him does this impact the feds raising rates well, uh, you know, that's the question, right? Is Does that enter into their decision-making uh, uh, process? Do they say, hang on now, we got to consider the debt? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think that they'll be swayed by that. Uh, and I don't think they should be. You know, uh, I think that they should make it, they should pursue their independence and make it uncomfortable on government to the point where if government is, is going to be profligate, why enable it? You know, if you have a, a, an alcoholic friend, uh, uh, you know, don't keep giving them a reason to drink. Uh, and if the Fed simply just, you know, con considers the level of debt that the government has and manages its interest rates so the government can manage its debt, it will almost enable the government to say, as long as the central bank has our back, we can afford more debt. Uh, well, make it unaffordable. Force them to make decisions to say, listen, do we really need to be spending all this money? For instance, in Canada, do we really need to be spending money uh, monitoring injection sites for heroin addicts? This is what we do. We have tax dollars that go to monitor these sites where heroin addicts can inject themselves without fear of ODing. 
Now, you may say that that's good or that's bad or whatever the case is, but really, really, you're running a deficit and this is what we're spending money on? Like, what else are we spending money on? That, that, that just, you know, for most people would say, really? You know? Anyways, um, so I think that there, there is something in, in saying that perhaps the Fed should not consider at all uh, the level of government debt because that's their business. That's their problem to solve. It's not the Fed's problem. Um, yeah, and again, if you just make it easy for them, they'll continue doing it, right? Much like the heroin addicts. If, oh, you mean I can inject myself here and everything's going to be fine? You give me the needle, there's a nurse on site, I'm uh, no risk? Oh, it's like bungee jumping. Yeah, I'll give that a shot. Who wants to jump off a bridge? No one. What if there was no risk? Hey, I'll jump off the bridge. You'll have more people who want to jump off the bridge. I'm ranting again, eh? Uh, a lot of momentum showing up in biotech pharma names. Yeah, a lot of them are making the 52-week high list. If you watch that from Wall Street Journal, a lot of them making the 52-week high list. Uh, no reported fundamentals, but are trading on prospects of drugs in their pipeline, of which I do not understand. Like, I mean, when I say I don't understand why they would be trading high, I don't understand the whole business. That's why I just stay away from it. Are these groups you ever consider trading? Nope. They would stay away from it because of the landmine risk of drug failure. That and I don't know. I don't know anything about this stuff. Uh, I would purely be gambling. Now, an index, perhaps, because an index takes out idiosyncratic risk, right? An index, perhaps. But to make bets on individual names, I mean, I, I, I have no idea. I uh, could not find where on the spreadsheet you found the forward EPS of 223.28. Okay, so on this one, you're not going to find a single cell that has that number. You're not going to find that. What you have to look for is Q2 2023, uh, Q3, which uh, it, on the spreadsheet will be uh, 063023. Uh, There'll be a number, 53 something. Then you look for 09. 30, 23, then you look for 12, 31, 23, and then you look for 0, 3, 3, 1, 2, 4, and you add up those four cells, and you'll get to that total. The Refinitiv website, okay, Refinitiv, uh, you're saying you, you uh, got it as of April 28th. Uh, they are behind uh, S&P. S&P has the updated numbers. You'll find that next week, Refinitiv has the same numbers that S&P had. So uh, use the S&P spreadsheet, not the Refinitiv data. Uh, do a video on U.S. debt ceiling. Okay, so uh, here's debt, and they say go no further. Uh, there we go. I know that was a long video, but <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, you know, I don't really uh, know that there's much to talk about it. Um, it's that... There's a certain amount of debt that they're that they can take on, and then they have to you have to get approval to go above that ceiling. And well, now it's becoming a fight. I mean, if, if debt to GDP were thirty percent, no one would be talking about this. No one would be talking about this. But it is in in uh, alarm territory at this point. So you got to say something about it. I mean, you have you have to do something here. Uh, but I I don't know that I would have enough. Uh, to do a video on it. Uh, in an old momentum video from your applied series, you explained uh, research technical analysis suggests there was no evidence supporting its use. It wasn't just me. It's a lot of academic research uh, that shows that it is no better than a coin toss. Could you broadly explain what you looked at and what your findings were? Um, just empirical observation that this chart pattern says this and half the time it works, half the time it doesn't work. Well, that's a coin toss. You know, if you're 50% right, so is a coin, right? That should be your benchmark is, is technical analysis better than a coin toss? Uh, and the answer is no, it's not. Uh, and there's a lot of academic studies that show, no, it's not better than a coin toss. Uh, so uh, I have several questions, mostly about home building and VIX. Would you say the big Canadian banks would be one way to bet on the Canadian home building sector? They account for a big majority of the mortgages in the country. Um, well, that's a bet on mortgages. I don't know that it's a bet on home builders because the mortgage is the full price, whereas the home builder has a gross margin. 
the home builder makes money on every house they sell. Um, no, I, I, I don't know that that would be direct. No. Uh, what do you think about buying leaps or, or buying uh, out of the money uh, calls as a way on select home builders to take advantage of low volatility? Uh, yeah, sure. Since you are very bullish about the home builders, would you go as far as considering doing a risk reversal? Well, first risk has to show up before I can reverse it. So uh, on a sell-off, a big sell-off, you might consider a risk reversal, but um, you know, uh, an under-leveraged synthetic long where you you know you're selling a put at 90 to buy a call at 120 on on Lennar, let's say, or, or something like that. Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, I I can get. I get you. You're trying to reduce uh, reduce risk uh, by doing that, but probably not. Uh, I think that I would probably just consistently sell 30 delta puts uh, because at some point the market, uh, you know, the home builders are going to do this and this kind of stuff. Well, then you'll get put. You'll get put. You'll get put. Premium, 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 premium. You'll get put. Premium, premium. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so you end up buying on the dips structurally because you've sold the put. You've set it up that way. Yeah, it's unsatisfying when there's no volatility. It's really unsatisfying because the premium just isn't there. But, you know, you got to play the market you got, not the market you want. If the premiums just aren't there, well, then the premiums just aren't there, Right. Home builders and constructors are industries that are usually among the first to suffer job losses when borrowing costs rise. However, they are showing persistent strength. Do you think the recession is still imminent regardless of these industries' performance? Well, they're already performing at recessionary levels to begin with because there's just a shortage of housing. Uh, so their margins are really, really fat on everything that they're selling. Uh, it would... I think as the economy improves, they'll sell more houses, but they'll sell more houses at lower margins because it'll become more competitive. I heard an argument that as the U.S. becomes more wealthy and quality of life improves, there is an increased focus on life longevity. What are your thoughts on healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP steadily rising over the past 60 years? Yeah, in the U.S., most definitely. Uh, but keep in mind that, that, you know, when we talk about health care spending in the U.S., um, that's not all American citizens. The U.S. is a destination spot for health care. Uh, so if, for example, um, if you uh, need an oncologist, uh, the best ones are in the U.S. If you need a cardiologist, the best ones are in the U.S., uh, there is a vibrant medical tourism industry, uh, especially in Canada, that if you need, uh, for example, uh, an MRI, it is faster to go to cross the border and go to Buffalo and get it done. Well, that shows up as uh, health care spending on U.S. GDP. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, it's not an export because you went there to get it done. So it just registers as domestic spending, but it wasn't done by a domestic resident. It was done by a foreign, uh, a, a traveler. Um, there are, if you need a knee surgery, Cincinnati is the place to go. And there are um, travel uh, firms here that will book like a thousand knee surgeries a year and they get them really cheap. And then they do medical tourism where you say, I need a knee surgery. They say, well... Uh, uh, the flight's leaving from Pearson. Uh, we're going to be staying at this hotel in Cincinnati. Your appointment is at this time. The bus will pick you up. They, they take care of the whole thing. So there is a lot of health care spending in the U.S. spent domestically on U.S. soil by foreigners traveling to the U.S. to get it done. Uh, so it may appear that the U.S. is spending a hell of a lot of money, 18% of GDP on health care, with terrible uh, health outcomes, but that's not the case, is that a lot of that, uh, quite a bit, and it's hard to pull apart, right? But a lot of it is um, because it's a destination for it. So uh, I think that probably continues. I don't see why it wouldn't. What are your thoughts on the current situation of the economy where marginal propensity to consume is extremely high and inventories are being drawn out? 
but the Fed wants to see a reduction in employment. Does the ISLM model still stand true? Uh, why wouldn't it? You'd have to tell me why you think that model doesn't stand true because I don't know what your thinking is to get there, but I don't know why it wouldn't. Um, so I don't know how to answer that other than say, why wouldn't it? Um, but you're not in front of me to, to give me your reason of why you think it perhaps wouldn't. Uh, what would be the consequences of the Fed delivering a mini Volcker shock? Um, well, a couple of things. Loss of credibility uh, because they have been very transparent and they have uh, given good guidance, good forward guidance. Uh, and if they want the market to continue to believe their forward guidance, if they want to continue to use that as a tool, they can't deviate from that forward guidance that much. Uh, now, at each meeting, they can say, uh, they can say, we are not promising that we're done, but we don't know if we're going further. The moment they say, okay, that's it, we're done, I think um, the market will move against them and they'll have to continue to move. They can't let the market know they're done. That's, that's kind of where they are, but I don't think that they would do that uh, at all. I know you mentioned you're not bullish on equity REITs, but uh, what about at these valuations? Still no. Retail, I can see why, uh, but what about residential, industrial storage, data centers? Uh, still no. Uh, is because uh, all these REITs use leverage. And um, you got, what, $2 trillion, I think, in the next two years of all of this, all of this debt having to roll over. Uh, so it doesn't matter if they're good. It matters if the bank is willing to roll over for them. Uh, and you have some banks, especially a lot of the regionals, with so much exposure to this that they would be more than happy to say, no, thank you. Um, go somewhere else, please. We, we want to reduce our, uh, our exposure to this asset. So no, I, 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 I'm, I'm not interested. It's not that I'm not interested in the business model. It's not that I'm not interested in the cash flow. It's just... The rollover risk right now is is the the big question mark. When the central bank is doing QE or QT, exactly what information should we be looking at on their balance sheets? You're not looking for the balance sheet. The balance sheet includes everything that they do. Uh, Google, uh, SOMA, uh, 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 the New York Fed will have uh, uh, that for you. Uh, this is the open market operations, uh, and this is where all the QE uh, goes and all the, the runoff, the balance, when they say their balance sheet runoff, it comes out of the SOMA. Let's see. Having a hard time following the logic behind Fed cutting rates, mortgage REITs would suffer in the short term. Well, uh, I didn't quite say that. Uh, the Fed would only cut rates if something in the economy broke. And if something in the economy breaks, all spreads are going to widen. All spreads on risky debt are going to widen, including mortgage-backed securities. They're going to widen. They just will. Uh, because uh, places uh, or, or holders will probably have to sell what they can uh, to raise liquidity, which means that gets thrown out. Prices get depressed. Spreads widen out. That's just... That's just the initial reaction that would happen. It's not like rates are coming down, uh, spreads are going to widen. It's what causes rates to come down is what's going to cause spreads to widen. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If rates are getting cut due to recession, the 30-year yield will come down faster uh, than the 10-year, than the 10-year, widening the spread and widening the spread on MBS and the 30-year. MBS in the 10 year. The duration of MBS is, is close to what the 10 year is. That's why the 10 year is used for hedging, uh, boosting returns on agency and annually. Yeah, you're missing the spread. It's, it's uh, the spread would widen, and most credit spreads would widen on everything. Uh, so even though rates are dropping, spreads would widen by more than the rates would drop. Uh, and uh, again, with uh, mortgage REIT companies, they hedge out interest rate risk and they lever up the spread. So any widening of the spread uh, is, at least for agency, 7.7 .7 times more deadly 
than uh, you know having no leverage. You said multiple times the dividends are smuggled in on a synthetic option position, not following the logic, assuming the uh, underlying stock would drop by the dividend amount, the long call would drop in value, uh, and the same strike short put would lose value as well. Uh, well, uh, so uh, let's say that uh, you have a stock, uh, let's say 10 bucks, and you know over the next year you're going to get a uh, dollar in dividends and you're going out a year to look at the put. Uh, well, we know that it's going to drop by at least a dollar over the course of the year, right? It's going to drop, maybe rise, drop, maybe rise, but uh, on a cumulative basis, it's going to drop by a buck. The put's going to have the present value of at least a buck in there on a continuously compounded basis. Uh, so as each dividend is paid, it comes out of the put. As each dividend is paid, it comes out of the put. So uh, you can sell a $10 put uh, and you might get uh, 90 cents uh, uh, because of the present value and you might get another 40 cents or let's uh, say you get another 60 cents for time value. Uh, so you get a buck 50. Uh, and if this thing stays at $10, you get the full dollar 50. The dividend is smuggled into the 150 because 90 cents of the value of that put uh, is that so that uh, as each dividend comes off, you'll notice that the put itself decreases in value. As each dividend comes off, it decreases in value. Uh, so even if it stays at 10 bucks and goes nowhere, uh, so you, you get it in the present value, the whole present value on a continuously compounded yield basis of what the stock is should be, for the most part, in the put. You talk about not seeing a supply of houses anytime soon, referring to homeowners that will be unlikely to sell into that market. Maybe that's true for single homeowners. What about private equity real estate firms? Well, no, I mean, it's true for everybody. Why would a, uh, a private uh, equity real estate firm uh, sell houses at valuations uh, that are lower because mortgage rates are higher? Why not wait for mortgage rates uh, to drop and the valuations to increase? Um, there would have to be something that forces them to has a correlate uh, some correlated event I, I shouldn't say some event that creates a correlated strategy where a whole bunch of them start selling at the same time uh, i've always been confused when someone talks about growth do they mean top line growth or net income growth i, I don't know i mean it could be one or the other i'd i'd, I'd need the context in which in which to see it in. But usually when we talk about growth, you could talk about economic growth. Economic growth is the driver of everything. Growth in revenues uh, could be growth, uh, you know, the, the growth in uh, operating earnings, growth in cash flows. Uh, it could be anything. CFAA's reading states, growth funds primarily invest in stocks whose earnings are expected to grow at a faster rate than earnings for the broad stock market. So those are earnings. Mo th those are probably operating earnings that they're referring to so in the context of publicly traded stock does growth always refer to sales growth uh, operating earnings if based on what this states operating earnings how do you know something is priced in or not you don't uh you don't you don't you just have a feeling that it may be or it may not be now some things you can look at and, and you can, you know, sort of get some idea of what's priced in. Like with Fed Funds Futures, because there is no carry involved in that, and because there is an objective Fed Funds rate we can look at, uh, you can look at where the index is, and you can see the cuts or the rate increases that the market is pricing in based on where the index is. That's uh, fairly objective. But when you look at oil at 65 and you say, is oil pricing in a recession? I don't know. I mean, some people will say, yeah, oil's pricing in a 40% probability of recession. It's, uh, you know, okay, well, somebody else will say it's 50%. Somebody else will say, no, no, it's just an oversupply. It's not pricing in any, uh, who knows? Um, it's a beautiful thing about this market is, you know, you can have an opinion that differs from anyone else. Uh, and uh, you can then make your own bet on it. If, if there was absolute objectivity there would be no no earning no profit in the market other than the risk-free rate if you had absolute objectivity so thank god there's behavioral biases right uh hoping you could provide some commentary 
on a growing narrative that appears to be getting increased traction in regard to potential U.S. dollar uh, de-dollarization, the emergence of the renminbi as a legitimate alternative. No. No, 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 no. Um, you need a freely floating currency to get this done. You need a currency that uh, represents a significant amount of central bank reserves. Um, you need a very large currency. You need a very trustworthy government. You need a very, very liquid treasury market and a very large treasury market to get that done. China is nowhere near those standards. Not by a country mile. So, no. No, I don't see that. Uh, while some dismiss this outcome in the absence of significant financial liberalization in, in China or major changes uh, to its balance of payments, which is at odds with the current national policies, others suggest a gradual shift in renminbi denominated global trade is achievable regardless to create a more multipolar FX market whereby the U.S. dollar, euro, and renminbi don't necessarily replace one another but coexist. I suppose ultimately, do you consider this narrative as something more driven by political rhetoric rather than something worth paying attention to in the context of equity and bond markets? I don't think it's something worth paying attention to. It's uh, an intellectual debate, uh, which is interesting to have. But beyond that, um, you know, you you I sort of follow Aristotle's advice in everything. You must describe the world as it is. Not the world that could be or the world as it should be. You must describe the world as it is. And right now, if crisis hit and you had to lend your money to a government, would you lend your money to the Chinese Communist Party or would you lend it to the U.S.? That's all you have to ask yourself. And I think your answer will be pretty much what, <laughs> what I think it should be, right? Uh, let's see. I know you mentioned you were out of equity REITs. This include agency. Agency is a mortgage REIT. Uh, is it possible the equity market is reflecting hard economic conditions but is being offset by a drastic fall in the value of the dollar that we are just not seeing through the haze? Uh, as the government continues to take on losses. The government is taking on losses? How? How is the dollar not going to come down? Okay, I'm... Government taking on losses. Where is it taking on losses? Um, government is taking on losses. No, you got me there. I don't know where. I don't know where that's coming from. Odds for twenty-five basis point hike went lower. Uh, why, why no mention even of that? Well, it do. You know why would it? Uh, 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 you know. Okay, I see the point you're trying to make that that um, that because of that you you may be thinking that the FOMC is going to say, look, uh, we've caused some trouble already. Maybe we should maybe we should relax on this stuff for a while. Okay, yeah, I I, I can see that that might uh, that might enter uh, into into some participants' view. I think it might. Sure, I'll go with that. Uh, debt ceiling and government shutdowns are different things. Government shutdowns are uh, where Congress can't agree on a budget for that year, uh, so parks get closed, non-essential workers are furloughed. That wouldn't happen until the end of this fiscal year at the earliest. Shutdowns are obnoxious and known to hamp, uh, happen, crimping government spending, but bondholders, pensioners, soldiers still get paid. What we're running into in June is a debt ceiling where the Treasury is flat out prohibited from borrowing more and doesn't have the money to cover any bills. Um, well, you know, I can see that, you know, shutdowns are used more often uh, than uh, in just debt ceiling issues. But if you have a debt ceiling issue, you're going to have shutdowns. So it's not as if, uh, you know, we could say they're different things. You know, how I don't know that you don't have a shutdown if, if, if you hit the debt ceiling. You do. Uh, and it would seem to me that well before you run out of money, you would start shutting down non-essential services. You know, a debt ceiling is almost the same thing as not being able to agree on a budget. There is no budget left. There is no money left to pay the bills or, you know, we're getting close to the point where there's no money and we want to try to extend the more critical services for as long as we can. So, you know, there will be shutdowns. Your point, I think, is that shutdowns are used for other things as well. True. 
let's see. Uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time in the Applied Series Q&A still says the live session is not started. Yeah, there was a whole issue on uh, that. 9 o'clock, there was a live session on Vimeo for the Applied Series. Nobody showed up. Yeah, you know, it got to 9.10. There's still zero people on. Nothing going on. So I said, okay, well, you know, I had one at noon that was well attended. I thought, okay, well, uh, it's going to be a holiday. It's May Day. And, and, and I guess it's, you know, at that time where... Everyone is, you know, doing their own thing because it was meant to be, uh, uh, you know, I had two different time zones. Uh, Vimeo is known for having issues here and there. Uh, and apparently uh, what seems to have happened is uh, the feed, while it was saying live on my side, nobody viewing on the other side was was not being received. Meanwhile, people were on. So, yeah, we uh, we are actively looking for a replacement for Vimeo because Vimeo does it does have a lot of problems uh, we just haven't found one that allows us to use it behind a paywall we're trying to find one that that allows interaction in terms of you can actually voice your question and we can have a conversation so that I can flesh out exactly what your question is as opposed to say okay I don't get your question haven't found a good one yet, but we are looking. So I think that's what uh, what happened uh, for that one. And uh, that's it.